So when you're starting to think about different isotope logs and the whole sort of re realm of isotope logs, there's actually a lot to work with. So this is stable isotope logs of water. Okay, so you can um, be looking through of all the different possible combinations and then also um, how abundant they are. And what I want you guys to do next is um, just decide in your own personal space what molecule you work with, you know, and think about how many, just start to jot down how many different isotope logs there are in your system. Just write them down, and then I want you to talk to your neighbor about it. And I'm sort of curious to what you guys come up with. So this is for water. So if you really with water, your work is done, and you can just go to sleep. But maybe you could just <laughs> think about something else. But so what I want you guys to sort of think about is get your head around this. So what molecule do you work with most? How many stable isotope, so stable isotope logs does it have? How many do you work with? Why don't you work with the others? So for water, I measure, I use, so I use mass 18, right? So that's 16, 116, 1H, 1H. I also am interested in, where's my one? I use 19 a lot, right? You guys, that's a common one, right? Uh, um, a 1H, a 2H, and a 16, right? Does that make sense? Does people do, okay. Uh, so where's the, which is the one that I use when I measure 17O? I'm measuring this one. Water was, oh no, not 2H. Uh, no, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm measuring this one, 19, okay? So usually people just measure, you know, for this case, you just measure the, the reasons why, you know, you just measure this one and this one is because it tells you a lot of information and all the other ones are really not abundant and hard to measure. And we thought that it didn't necessarily give us that much more information, okay? So you only do hard things if it's actually worth your while, right? <laughs> we can measure this and I hope you guys will, you know, believe me by the end of this talk that this is actually, not only you can believe me that it's hard to measure, it's not actually that hard to measure, but that we, it's actually worth our while to measure it, okay? Um, in part, and so but these other ones, like they're just gonna be super, so look at this abundance. So this is gonna be basically, you know, 900 and, uh, basically, uh, you know, 997, 100,000 um, ppm. This is, you know, 12, uh, 0.12 ppm, 0.6 ppm. These abundances are super, super low, okay? So we're at 400 ppm for this isotope log of water, okay? Um, so it's just a matter of you know, what's actually abundance and actually what's, what's possible to sort of measure. Okay, what's another reason why, or well, maybe I'll ask you guys in terms of what are, what are some of the molecules that, what are other molecules that you guys have been thinking about? Certainly people work with other things other than water, huh? Methane. Methane, okay. So how many did you come up with quickly? I came up with like eight. Eight, okay. So what are some of the limitations of why you haven't worked with Yeah. Okay, so 13 C and so what what's the what's the mass of what you would actually measure? So you're so that so a methane right, so this would be this a normal methane, right? Which is this would all this would all what mass would this be? Um, that would be twelve or sixteen. Okay. And then what are the other methanes that you would measure that so let's say this is a a thirteen C one H four, right? We'll sort of make this easy, and then you could do a 12C, um, you can sort of continue to go on, but one thing, why are we focusing on mass here? What's some, some of some issues that come up with mass and what you're measuring? If you're actually trying to make a measurement, yeah? Yeah, so this is the problem. So what we call it, if you have two different, if two different ice molecules with different sort of isotope log combinations, but they have the same mass, you know what we call them, right? We have, so we can just call it isobaric inter interference, right? Okay, and that is the problem with 17O. That's why nobody likes 17O, right? Because in 17O, if you have a 13C, 16O, 16O, it looks, It's the same mass, it's an isobaric interference, right, with this measurement that you're actually interested in, right? And so this is the problem. So a big sort of hurdle 
in thinking about these, a lot of these different isotopologues, not only is it they're low abundance, not only are hard to measure, but part of the reason why they're hard to measure is this isobaric interference. And some of the, uh, the analytical improvements that have been made is try to overcome those kinds of interferences, okay? Um, all right, so there's lots of different lists up here in terms of this is just for N2, O2, CO2 um, in terms of different um, isotopologues of common gases and their abundances. And this is from Eiler 2007. There, uh, there's another review paper that I'll reference a lot um, that by Chris and Farquhar that also has a good um, sort of list of them. So you can see the abundances. Okay, so this is from this Eiler et al. 2014 review paper. And so I think it's worth just reading this quote. 20 years ago, a young stable isotope geochemist or ecologist, whatever, you know, needed to be aware of only one sort of analytical instrument, the near type gas source mass, gas source isotope mass, ratio mass spectrometer, and the field rarely considered subjects beyond the bulk isotope compositions of the light volatile elements, HCN, O, and S, okay? So what has happened recently that has changed the game? Um, and so emergence of the multi-collector uh, mass spec of these plasma mass spectrometers that measure metal isotopes routinely. Oh, and this, sorry, there's a couple of them. I know you guys are shuffling a paper. This is not on your slide, sorry. You're, so just absorb it. This is in the review paper. I've added, if, I've added a couple slides, and I said slide added since handout printing, but sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so these, um, these, uh, you, the ability to these multi-collector instruments to measure metal isotopes routinely and precisely um, by both traditional gas source and thermal ionization techniques has really expanded our sort of analytical advances. Improvements in ion microprobes, and I guess Turi can tell us about this, but in situ micron scale measurements of solids with really high precision that's enabling us to get small scale um, information. Improved analytical methods and standardization approaches. This is what I'm gonna talk about today. This is what has enabled my research to really change. Um, but measurements of elements with more than two stable isotopes, like O and S isotopes, with unprecedented precision, enabling examination of subtle variations in mass laws um, in both stable isotope fractionations and clumped isotope geochemistry. But you know, in CO2, O2, there's other, there's other molecules that we just haven't done before. So this is sort of the, this is the, the frontier that I've been involved in. There's another frontier that I'll just even mention, but that you guys are just aware of, is develop of this high resolution gas source multi-collector mass spectrometers. And this is measuring isotopologues of molecules and their fragments with resolution of the isobaric interferences that basically we just talked about, which extends the field of clumped isotope geochemistry beyond single compounds like CO2 and O2 to a range of systems, including volatile and semi-volatile organics. So this high resolution, basically sort of a mixing of these multi-collector instruments and um, these traditional gas source mass spectrometers with increased um, resolution have enabled us to sort of try to get at some of these isotopologue systems, okay? I'm not gonna go into detail on them, but I just want you to sort of be aware that we're, there's a frontier out there and to you for to be aware, so if this is like, if you're really, if you have questions about methane and that there might be a process within methane that's actually, there's various clumping in methane or that, that actually the clumping in methane might be actually sensitive to something that you're interested in, like temperature of methane formation Clumping is actually sensitive to that, okay? And there's been papers on that already, okay? And so this is something that is out there and it's, it's yours for the, it's yours to engage, okay? So I'm gonna sort of end the general terminology. Does anyone have any questions on sort of this primer start? We are, yeah. Yeah, so we'll talk about this a little bit, but a lot of it is, um, you, it's, you're defining your reference frame, and so it's a little bit the, um, you can define it in any way you want. So some of, some of the way that it's defined is in terms of, you'll define it relative to equilibrium processes. And so you say, okay, I'm gonna say, if equilibrium processes were governing this relationship, then I'm gonna say, then my capital, then everything, if equilibrium is happening, then everything would follow on one sort of relationship, and any DV, and, and, um, that capital delta would be zero, right? Because you're always gonna be on that line. And if it's not equilibrium, then you'll fall off that line. I'll also mention um, an example for oxygen isotopes and triple oxygen isotopes where there's a line of relationship, which is basically this, what's called the terrestrial line. So everything that happens on Earth follows one relationship and things that are happening extraterrestrially fall off the line. So there's a TFL, the terrestrial fractionation line. So these things can be defined in, in how you want them. They're very similar to how you define DXS, actually, right? DXS is defined as a deviation of something, right? So we could actually, um, so what's the definition of DXS? Or what's the, what's the slope, 
What's the, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the equation for the line that describes a meteoric water line? Oxygen, like just oxygen. Okay, so the dxs is, is going to be is um, is going to be the deviation from this line, right? Okay, and so um, that's how. So you could also sort of define it as some some people define it's as the intercept, right? Or some people define it as the you know sort of within the intercept from it. So it's the same sort of idea of defining. So if you have you know delta eighteen o and delta d. And this is your line with your meteoric water line, right? Any deviation from this, right? You basically calculate it, and that's your dxs, right? If this is your line, and this is so um, with a slope of eight, and this is oh, ten, sorry, this is ten. This would be the intercept of ten, and this this would be your dxs. So you could basically call that capital delta and some capital d if you wanted to, right? It's the same idea. You basically define it. You make your own space. That's useful in some sort of capacity. <laughs> 